The purpose of this recording is to help you solve the biggest problem you now face or ever will face, namely, to get your ideas accepted by others. It gives you to think and act favorably with you, to influence human behavior, to sell yourself, your skills, products, or services, to increase your income, to become a competent leader, and to attain security and enjoy the peace of mind essential to a full and, and happy life. The man who knows how will always have a job and make a living, but the man who knows why and can state it forcefully, fluently, concisely, and convincingly in speech will always be his leader or his boss. When you are in school, you are told that knowledge is power. Many were led to believe that knowledge alone would bring financial and professional rewards. But after a few years in the practical world of realities, those who have achieved any measure of success learn that although knowledge was an absolute necessity, there was another factor even more important, the ability to speak well, to forcefully, fluently, and convincingly express ideas that caused others to act favorably. This is an art, the greatest art in all human affairs. An inventor may conceive an idea that would greatly contribute to his fellow men. However, if the idea remains fallow in his mind, it will be of no value to him or to mankind. This also is true of any idea or skill that any of us may possess. Red Motley, publisher of Parade Magazine and one of the world's great salesmen said, nothing ever happens until someone sells something. An idea must be sold to become alive. A skill must be demonstrated to be of use. To sell your ideas, suggestions, or skills, you must be as an artist who paints with oils and brushes upon a canvas. With words, you must paint upon the canvas of other minds pictures that will convince your hearers of the worth to them of that which you have to offer. Only then will you get favorable action. Throughout history, we are constantly apprised of the one outstanding quality possessed by every great leader. He could communicate well with others. In the crises of the Second World War, two men, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, stood out above all the rest. They were masters of the spoken word. Roosevelt, with his fireside chats, and Churchill, with his courage-filled oratory, raised our sights to victory. Their words, particularly those of Churchill, will be remembered and quoted as long as free men meet. Yes, the great leaders in all of the annals of recorded history had this one quality in common, they could speak well. By the use of the spoken word, these leaders influenced the thinking of others and got them to do what they wanted them to do, not always in the common good, as witnessed the results of Hitler and Mussolini. Other men of the time and place of these leaders may have possessed greater knowledge, but their names are not indelibly inscribed in the records of their time because they lack the power of forceful expression. History records the names of numerous geniuses, men who contributed much to man's well-being, who were recognized only after they were dead. While alive, they lived in poverty and anonymity for the simple reason they lacked the ability of forceful communication. The man who has this power finds that others turn to him for guidance. Leadership and money come his way. He is honored, and people seek his advice and friendship. Yes, the ability to speak well is vital to your personal success and happiness. You can learn to speak well with one person, before a few or before hundreds. The way is not difficult, but it does require persistent effort on your part. Success in every human endeavor entails time spent in preparation and in training. All training is a never completed process of exercise and practice in acquiring or improving skill in the application of knowledge to that which you aim to accomplish. This training must be instigated by you and carried on by you. No one else can do it for you. John D. Rockefeller Sr., founder of the Standard Oil Company, said, the ability to deal with people is the most important, and I will pay more for that ability than for any other under the sun. To speak well, so that you will favorably influence others and get them to do what you want them to do, is of paramount importance, not only in your business contacts, but in every contact with another person in every area of human activity. This applies to everyone, regardless of age, sex, or occupation. Some people are prone to believe that technical knowledge is the real basis for success. Yet, for example, the highest paid men in the engineering field, with rare, if any exceptions, are not those who know most about engineering, but those who are able to sell their technical abilities with words that motivate their listeners to favorable action. Some years ago, Purdue University rated a graduating class of engineers on their personalities, good, fair, and poor. Their careers were observed. Five years later, those who are rated good were earning on the average $1,500 more per year than those who are rated fair or poor. 
One of the qualities possessed by those rated good was the power of effective speech. They could express their ideas forcefully and convincingly. The very basis of a fine personality is the ability to communicate favorably with others. The objective of this recording is to show you how you may use your knowledge more effectively through a better understanding of the art of speech. Also, I hope it will debunk the myth that to speak effectively is a rare and mysterious gift lavished upon a select few. To speak is as natural as drinking when thirsty, eating when hungry, or resting when tired. These things came to you naturally. Likewise, you learn to talk as a natural sequence to living. This ability manifested itself at an early age, and thereafter, every time you connected two or more sentences, you made a speech. In reality, therefore, you began your speech-making at an early age and have done it successfully ever since. But you never thought you were making a speech, as you did not have to stand before others and talk about some particular thing for a stated period of time. I could never do that, you say. Thus you are licked before you start, because in your mind you have set up a negative and defeatist attitude. At this point, I would like to call to your attention the words of William James, medical doctor, philosopher, and professor at Harvard. In 1900, the year that saw the invention of the electric light bulb and the practical automobile, he did not refer to them, but said, the greatest discovery of my generation is that human beings may alter their lives by altering their attitudes of mind. Yes, before you can, you must believe you can. Once, after a talk, I was approached by a man of about 45, who told me that he was vice president of a large bank in New York City. During the conversation, I learned that he was happily married and had a son of 15 years of whom he was very proud. He told me that the boy was a fine scholar and an outstanding athlete. He said, I want that boy to be able to stand on his feet and express himself well, something I have never been able to do and which I have often regretted, but I just couldn't do it. I'd be so upset and nervous that I wouldn't be able to think of a thing to say. I said you could make a very effective talk if you really felt and believed that the things you wanted to say were important for your listeners to hear. He disagreed and reiterated that he just couldn't make a speech. I then spoke to him as follows. Suppose your son was accused of killing a young girl. A mob had him and was preparing to hang him from a tree in the village square of the town in which you live. You learned of it and rushed down. Many in the gathering were known to you. They allowed you to talk with your son. Daddy said, I didn't do it. I have never in my life seen the girl. You knew your son. You knew that he was telling you the absolute truth. Wouldn't you appeal to the leader of that mob to allow you just 10 minutes to talk with them? And after the 10 minutes were granted, wouldn't you make a forceful plea in your son's behalf? Why? Because you would be emotionally aroused. You would know what you were talking about, your own son. That emotional arousement, that knowledge of your son, that faith and belief in him, would activate your glands, pour powerful secretions into your bloodstream, strengthen your muscles, and fire your imagination to undreamed heights. You would sway the mob to your thinking. Now, I admit, a speaker cannot expect such a stimulus before every talk, but he can achieve practically the same result through conscious thought of the responsibility that a talk imposes upon him, the responsibility to bring his audience a message. Making a speech is really not complicated. It is relatively simple. So let's erase the mystery surrounding it. To make a talk, there are three necessary requisites. You must have a mind stored with knowledge. You must select the specific knowledge needed for the talk in question. You must then present it effectively. Let's discuss these three requisites. First, the acquisition of knowledge. Years ago, I set up the 3010 power formula and have been talking about it ever since. In my opinion, it is the most effective method I have ever found, and yet it is a very simple one to initiate. All you need do is set aside 30 minutes every day for study. But first, you must set a goal for yourself. You must determine the area of knowledge in which you want to become expert. Once you have made that decision, begin to read 30 minutes every day, the writings of authorities in that area of thought. Always have a dictionary at hand, and every time you come across a word with which you are not thoroughly familiar, Look it up immediately, and in your mind, make up two or three sentences using that word. This practice will constantly enlarge your vocabulary. As a speaker, a large vocabulary is a must. Read aloud at least 10 minutes during the 30-minute study period. Abraham Lincoln said, I read aloud because then I hear it, and I see it, and I do not forget it. As you read aloud, you will not only get a double sensory impression, 
you will also develop a facility of expression, better enunciation, and character of voice. Your voice will grow stronger through this exercise, just as your muscles grow stronger through regular, systematic exercise. Never forget that your voice is the instrument upon which you play the symphony of your life. Your tongue must become the pen of a ready brain that writes with strokes bold and faint, heavy and light. In my opinion, reading aloud is the greatest aid to better speech it has been mine to use after more than 50 years of study and experience. As you read aloud, read both fast and slow. Also read in a whisper. This reading in a whisper is a remarkable help in eliminating the anders, ers, and ahs, and the other word whiskers that mar so many talks and conversations. After reading aloud regularly for a few weeks, imagine yourself before an audience. Put emphasis and conviction into your reading. Listen to good recordings. As you go along with the speaker reading the script, you will develop a feel for proper emphasis. I regularly listen to the fine recordings that Success Motivation Institute has made available. I have gotten much from them. We all live in a world of words. They are symbols. We think with them. They form pictures in our minds. Right now, by the use of a word, I can cause you to see that which I wish you to see. For example, automobile. You are now seeing one. So am I. Maybe not the same one that you are seeing, but we are both seeing an automobile. Yes, we live in a world of words, a veritable picture gallery. As you develop a vocabulary that adds beauty and power to your expression, you will live in a gallery of masterpieces and not walk through aisles of mediocrity. A knowledge of that about which you wish to speak, plus a good vocabulary, will enable you to select the right words at the right time to project the picture in your mind to the canvas of your listener's mind. Your grammar is important. Here is another place where reading aloud makes itself felt as you listen to the prose and poetry of the masters and at the same time see their words in print before you. You will develop a definite feel for correct expression. Speaking of expression, it is said that Tallulah Bankhead, the actress, can run the gamut of human emotions by reading names in a telephone book. This lends credence to the statement that it is not so much what you say as how you say it. For example, Edmund Burke's speeches made in England's House of Commons many years ago are still studied today as classic models of our rhetorical expression. He wrote beautifully, but he was a flop as a speaker. When he arose to speak in the House of Commons, the members left in droves. Your audience must feel en rapport with you. There must be mind-to-mind -mind and heart-to-heart -heart communication. The secret of a good delivery is simple. You must believe that that which you have to say is important to your listeners. You must tell it to them with the directness, sincerity, and enthusiasm that you would relate to your family or to a friend an interesting happening you saw or of which you were a part. You would make them see what you saw and feel what you felt. This, too, you must do with an audience. You will if you forget that you are making a speech and simply relate what is in your mind because you feel that they would enjoy sharing it with you. Never try to imitate a speaker whom you have heard, no matter how great you thought him. You can never be him. You will always be an imitation. Remember, you are you, an individual unique in all creation. There is not another just like you. Ralph Waldo Emerson said there comes a time in every man's education when he realizes that envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide and that he must take himself for better or for worse as his portion. Once you do this, you can say, this is me. This is what I have to work with, and I'm going to do a lot with it because it is good raw material. It just needs proper molding and training, and I am going to give it that beginning now. Besides reading in the area in which you seek greater knowledge, you will find that reading poetry is excellent exercise. Also, great literature, such as passages from the Psalms, the Sermon on the Mount, and the Book of Job, will give you a sense of the dramatic a feel for beauty and the power of words. You could not put your hand into a pot of glue without some of the glue sticking to it. So, too, you cannot consistently put the great thoughts of the great masters through your mind without a lot of their power resting with you. Samuel Gompers, founder of the American Federation of Labor, and for many years its president, was an outstanding speaker. At an early age, he began working in a cigar factory. His job was to read to the workers as they worked. He did this for more than five years. He mocked words he did not fully understand and later looked them up in a dictionary. He said, I owe whatever facility of expression may be mine to those years I spent as a reader to the workers in a cigar factory. Also, he might have added that his love of knowledge was incubated during those years of reading. As I said previously, we all learn to speak at an early age, and most of us learn to make ourselves understood quite well because we spoke without conscious thought of anything but the idea we were expressing. 
Thus, we expressed our thoughts naturally as they came to us. We were ourselves. An actor, for example, is rarely a top speaker. He is never himself, but is always playing a part, voicing thoughts not his own. They are those written for him, which he memorizes but seldom feels deeply, as they are not his own sentiments. There is always something disingenuous in doing this. The true speaker, on the other hand, must think and feel that which he speaks on every occasion. When he does this, he need not concern himself about gestures or posings. His movements automatically become the outward expression of his inner feelings. They are individualized to his personality. In developing your early talks, stay within familiar areas. Again, I repeat that I believe you should specialize if you expect recognition and demand. After more than 50 years of speech making, I restrict myself to three areas, salesmanship, human behavior, and the American way of life. I confine myself to these areas in my writings as well. No matter the subject you choose, always have in your mind at least four times the material you would use. For instance, if you are to give a 30-minute talk, have at least two hours of usable material available in your mind. That is being properly prepared and will give you an unshakable confidence. You will know that you will not flounder without anything to say. Add to your knowledge daily through the 3010 power formula. Never skip a day. Also, carry a small memo pad in your pocket. Whenever you hear or read anything of particular interest, make a note of it. Keep these scraps. Put them in a desk drawer. At the end of each week, sort them and put them in envelopes appropriately labeled humor, philosophy, history, and so forth. There will come a time when you will need material for a talk. These scraps will then become a source of valuable ideas. Practice, practice, and practice. The reading aloud portion of the 3010 power formula, it will pay you high dividends. Some years ago, a test was carried on at a physical education school in Massachusetts. Two groups, each of 30 young athletes, were given instruction in juggling three balls in the air simultaneously. One group practiced 15 minutes every other day. The other group practiced five minutes every day. At the end of the test period, the group that practiced 15 minutes every other day, even though they spent one-third more time in practice, were but 45% as efficient as the group that practiced five minutes every day. This bears out the words of Heber J. Grant, former president of the Latter-day Saints in Salt Lake City. He said, that which we persist in doing becomes easier to do, not that the nature of the thing becomes less difficult, but through doing, our power to do increases. As you proceed with your program of study and practice, you will undoubtedly experience periods when you will seem to make no progress. In fact, you may feel that you are backsliding. Do not be alarmed or discouraged. This happens to all of us in every area of human activity. For example, due to the fact that I am tall, hand balancing was difficult. Yet I was determined to learn to do a good one-hand stand. I practiced religiously, day after day, month after month, in the gym and on the beach. Every once in a while, I would be able to stand on one hand for about three seconds. Then for days thereafter, I couldn't even do that. One evening, in the gym of the Brooklyn Central YMCA, where for years I trained with Charlie Atlas, who, by the way, was a master of hand balancing, I slowly muscled up to a two-hand stand, leaned to the right, lifted my left hand off the floor, and raised it until it rested alongside my left leg. I was amazed. I seemed to be locked into position and held the balance for at least 10 seconds. That same evening, I tried to do it again and again without success. It was a week or 10 days later before I was able to do it. Then gradually, my proficiency increased. Soon, I was able to hold a good uh, balance for a few seconds every time I tried. But it was months before I could hold a one-hand balance for 30 seconds, which was my goal. And to do that meant daily practice. If I skipped a few days, my sense of balance suffered. Both the mind and the body are subject to the same laws and experience the same peaks and valleys of accomplishment. But the rewarding fact is that motivated by a burning desire, if you continue to study and practice, never quitting, you will succeed. You must believe you can and keep on believing you can. Remember, as a youngster, the motto you saw on the schoolroom wall, perseverance conquers all things, corny, yes, but still true. When you are resolutely determined to do a thing, it is half done already. Then when you keep persistently trying, eventually you've got to succeed. Enthusiasm is a prime requisite for your success as a speaker. In fact, enthusiasm is a prime requisite for success in every area of human endeavor. 
The man who lacks enthusiasm usually lacks confidence and is easily discouraged. He labors under a terrific handicap that eventually destroys him. Yet no individual need be plagued with these feelings and the negative attitudes of mind which they engender. As human beings, we all have our low moments when everything looks dark and gloomy. But these sloughs of depression can be smoothened and made less frequent, if not entirely eliminated. Then these dark moments will be no more than swiftly passing shadows flitting across sun-drenched days. The magic force that wields this power is enthusiasm. The dictionary defines enthusiasm as inspiration, ardor, fervent seal, uh, intense desire, feeling, or emotion. A preacher might add, it is faith in action. I might add, enthusiasm links knowledge to purpose and gives it driving force. Lord Balfour, British statesman of World War I, said, enthusiasm moves the world. The word comes to us straight from ancient Greece. They believed that an enthusiast was a God-intoxicated man, a man with a living God inside him, driving him to action and words that made him an exceptional man. I believe that enthusiasm is knowledge on fire. That's why we say a man is fired with enthusiasm. Benjamin Disraeli was such a man. When he first arose to speak in the House of Commons, he was laughed off his feet. He waited for the mockery to subside and said, Gentlemen, the time will come when you will crowd these benches to hear me. Disraeli possessed three qualities needed by every successful speaker. Enthusiasm, confidence, sincerity. He believed implicitly in himself. He believed in England. He believed in his ability to serve England. He was confident that the day would come when the members of the House of Commons would flock to hear him. That day came. Benjamin Disraeli became Great Britain's Prime Minister and one of the House of Commons' greatest speakers. He dared to trust his own competence. Nothing could turn him from his goal. Therefore, he did not fail. Do not confuse enthusiasm with excitement. There is a tremendous difference between them. Enthusiasm is sincere, grand, impressive, and resistless. It wells up from the secret depths of our being and is self-controlled. Excitement is shallow, lacking in depth, short-lived, unconvincing, and often hysterical. Excitement soon repels, but enthusiasm is contagious, spreading and permeating all with whom it comes into contact. An enthusiastic speaker with a thorough knowledge of his subject and the words with which to express himself is a listened-to speaker. Yes, the world does belong to the enthusiast. He has never been admired, listened to, and respected. He is never ignored. Because his enthusiasm is virile and real, it is life itself. Everything great and noble in the history of man's achievement is a story of the victory of enthusiasm over indifference, jealousy, fear, hatred, and ignorance. Nothing worthwhile has ever been accomplished without it. It has ever been the inspiring force that has motivated man. You can become enthusiastic. You can acquire this priceless attribute and walk through greener pastures, reaping a richer harvest of life's better things. How? By cultivating a simple yet tremendously effective habit. Picture yourself in your mind, enjoying the success you are aiming for and knowing that you will achieve it. Hold fast to that picture, seeing it constantly. Live with it throughout each day. These positive thought picturizations will engender positive actions, enthusiastic actions, as we think, so we are. Here are three ways that will enhance your enthusiasm and bolster your confidence. First, as Socrates, one of the wise men of all time, said, Know thyself. Know your temperament, your motivations, your strengths, your weaknesses. Second, know why you have confidence in your ability to meet situations and handle them successfully. This will result from the training uh, this recording outlines. Third, recognize the fact that with the 3010 power formula, you are growing mentally every day, that you are constantly adding to your knowledge, and through reading aloud, you are daily increasing your power to effectively use that knowledge through forceful, fluent, and convincing expression. Enthusiasts soon understand each other. Thus, when you speak with enthusiasm, an audience, whether it be one or a thousand, will be drawn together with you in understanding in an agreement. I'll now discuss the making of a talk and begin with planning your talk. When my former platform associate, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, the famous clergyman, author and speaker, began preaching, his father, also a minister of renown, asked Norman to send him a ten-word telegram every Saturday night, summarizing the sermon he would preach on Sunday. This was a rewarding experience for the then young preacher. To organize your knowledge effectively, put the framework of your ideas on paper. There are two valid reasons for doing this. First, you will possess your subject better and thus avoid the risk of digression. Second, when you commit your thoughts to writing, 
you clarify your thinking. It becomes clearer to you, and things of which you are not before conscious present themselves. Speaking and writing are not the same. We do not write as we speak, nor speak as we write. Very often, an able speaker is a poor writer, just as a fine writer is often a poor speaker. To speak well, however, you must be able to crystallize your thinking. You can best crystallize, analyze, and put your thoughts together in orderly fashion after you have put them down on paper, where you can see them. Speaking is not just thinking out loud. It is far more. Speaking is thinking with method and distinctiveness, so that as you express your thoughts, your listeners will understand and feel them with you. Yes, to speak well, you must master your own thoughts, and the best way to do this is to write them out. When you learn to put your thoughts on paper in clear and orderly fashion, you will understand them. You must do this before you can hope to make others understand and agree with them. Until you learn how to commit your thoughts to writing, you will never learn how to hold and sway an audience, and that is the purpose of every talk. In preparing a talk, there are two initial stages, namely the determination of the subject and the idea for its treatment. In other words, this simply means that the speaker must know what he is going to talk about and how he is going to present it. Most speakers have to speak about subjects that over the years have been treated by other speakers. There are few, if any, subjects that someone hasn't thought upon and spoken about. Therefore, you should familiarize yourself with what others have said on the subject you wish to use. Carefully select their most valuable and striking thoughts. Then analyze and sift them with discernment and penetration. Work them into your own thinking and understanding. Expressing them in your own language, they will then become a part of your thinking. As the time approaches for you to speak, on the back of an envelope or a piece of paper, list the main points of your talk in the order you plan to present them. Read it over a few times, then tear it up, discard it. This will have the psychological effect of putting you on your own. It will also cause you to think and feel what you say, not just recite the words. You will capture and hold your audience, an impossibility with a written or memorized talk which bores listeners. Here is a five-step formula for the preparation of every talk, listing the steps in their proper order. One, arrest attention. Two, arouse interest. Three, create desire. Four, convince. Five, get favorable action. Aristotle said, you learn to play the flute by playing the flute. This is a simple truism, but it should be remembered. You could listen to the world's top swimming coach tell you everything he knows about swimming. Yet to learn how to swim yourself, you would have to get into the water and practice basic strokes. Likewise, to learn how to speak, you must get up before an audience and speak. There is no substitute for this. Do not fear failure. It is the practice essential to success. Since the first step in preparing a talk is to put your thoughts down on paper, do it now. Select a subject out of your own experience and use the five-step formula in preparing and organizing a talk. For example, presume that you are asked to give a ten-minute talk to help raise money for the United Fund drive. Step one, arrest attention. Point out to your audience how they personally will benefit by doing as you are going to suggest. This will lead into step two, arouse interest. Relate an appropriate anecdote. Throw out a challenge. Dramatize an incident about the United Fund. Step three, create desire. Talk about the objectives of the United Fund, its devotion to the people's needs and its accomplishments among the sick and the helpless. Talk about the things the United Fund has already accomplished and about which your listeners may be familiar. Step four, convince your audience. Demonstrate and give proof material by relating a specific case. Make it as dramatic as possible. Become personal. Tell your audience how you feel and why you feel that your contribution to the fund helped you mentally and spiritually. Step five, get favorable action. Bring home to each individual in your audience how their ever so small help will mean so much to those less fortunate who have so little. Suggest definite action by each person present and make that action seem easy to take. Repeat your promise made in step one as to how each individual present will personally benefit by doing as you suggest. This five-step formula is a time-tested and proven method for favorably influencing others. It is a thinking pattern. It works in all areas with all people. Its power lies in the fact that it follows the mental steps every individual goes through before coming to a decision to act. Again, these steps are attention, interest, desire, conviction, and action. But remember, if you fail to get attention, which is step one, you will never arrive at your final objective, which is to get your listeners to do what you want them to do. Actually, there are but three types of speeches. One, speeches designed to inform. Two, speeches designed to get action. 
three speeches designed to entertain. The first includes all lecture-type talks, as well as those of an inspirational nature. The second, the action talks, include all sales presentations, most political talks, all drive talks, such as the United Fund and all others designed to get specific action. Entertainment talks are obvious. They are designed solely for the entertainment of an audience. Uh, the strictly entertainment-type talks need have no particular pattern. Uh, the humorist tells one story after another as his only aim is to amuse. Talks that are a combination of a desire to inform and get action need a definite pattern. The humor in these talks is used mainly to illustrate a put over a point. If you have had little or no speaking experience, you may, however, have given thought to various speech topics which you feel are important, interesting, or entertaining. The thing to do is to accept the first opportunity you get to make a talk. Do not wait until you think that you are ready. Accept the invitation and then get ready. Do not hesitate to speak because you fear that someone else may do it better. You do it and get better. Remember what Aristotle said? You learn to play the flute by playing the flute. Here are some do's and don'ts that are important to bear in mind. When you get up to speak, don't hesitate. Don't apologize for your lack of experience, nor beg the audience's indulgence. At least outwardly display the confidence of an experienced speaker. This very act of acting confident will help you to develop confidence as you speak. Of course, you should never give the impression of cockiness. An audience will resent it. After you're introduced, you may acknowledge the introduction. A story, especially if the joke is on you, fits in very well at this point. It relaxes your listeners and establishes a rapport between you and them. This is a particularly good procedure if the introduction is flowery and flattering, as it will get you off to a good start. I use this method, and it has never failed me in more than 50 years. There are, however, many other ways to effectively begin your talk. One is to establish an immediate common interest with your audience, such as background experience or beliefs. Some professional speakers do not indulge in any preliminaries, but go directly into step one by stating their objectives clearly and dramatically. Each speaker must learn through experience his strengths and weaknesses and develop the technique best suited to his personality. You must keep your knowledge in orderly sequence as you deliver it. A mass of knowledge that is not orderly arranged and presented will make for confusion in the minds of your listeners. This is why it is so important to carefully arrange your material on paper, then study and analyze it before you deliver it. When talking on a controversial subject, it is doubly important that you marshal all of your facts. Study them carefully and digest them thoroughly. Get the facts on the other side of the subject as well. Do the same with them. Then and then only will you be prepared to discuss a controversial subject. When you come right down to it, most subjects have more than one side to them, and there will always be a percentage in every audience who favors the other side. Thus, it behooves you to know both sides. It will avoid embarrassing questions. I do not tell jokes as a rule. I do tell humorous anecdotes to illustrate points, true stories out of my own life and experience, but rarely, if ever, a joke just for a laugh. I am not a humorist and want to be taken seriously. Mark Twain once said, I am sorry that I got a reputation as a humorist. Now no one takes me seriously. Unless you wish to become recognized as a comedian, leave the jokes for joke's sake to the professionals in that field. As I said, I usually open my talks with a story that puts me down. Audiences love it. But I never apologize to an audience for being there. I do not tell them that I am unprepared or inexperienced. When you tell people that you aren't much of a speaker, you will be surprised how many will agree with you, who otherwise may have thought you were fairly good. The two parts of a speech that I deem most important are the opening and the close. I always prepare the first and last few sentences of every talk. The rest I extemporize, as through many years, use of the 3010 power formula, I have stored the needed knowledge, the facts and the thoughts. And as the philosopher said, crowding in come the words unsought. Many speakers use a few lines of poetry as a close. This is effective when the poetry is compatible with the theme of the talk. Bartlett's quotations is an excellent source for pertinent quotes. This, Roger's Thesaurus, and a good dictionary are three books that should be at every speaker's hand, and they should be used frequently. In delivering a talk, avoid technical language wherever possible. Use comparisons with which your audience is familiar. Do not try to make too many points in your talk. William James used to counsel to make but one point in a talk. He also stressed the need of complete understanding yourself before you can make others understand you. I continually stress the 3010 power formula. The man who follows this formula stores a mass of information 
Out of this, he is able to formulate ideas and thoughts of his own. As suggested, do not hesitate to use the great thoughts of others to stimulate your own thinking. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address is regarded as one of the three or four great utterances of man. Recall his words, that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Were they new when he delivered them? Theodore Parker, Daniel Webster, President James Monroe. These men gave voice to the same ideas years earlier. 400 years before the birth of Christ, Cleon, the Athenian, in a speech before his people, referred to a ruler of the people, by the people, and for the people. Who knows where he got it from? Style is important, and while I advise never to try and copy another speaker's style, I have found it stimulating and helpful to listen to good speakers and good recordings, and while listening to the latter, follow along reading the script. I am often asked if clothes are important to a speaker. My answer to that question is found in Shakespeare's Polonius. Costly thy raiment as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy, rich not gaudy, for the apparel oft proclaims the man. Senator William Borah, one of the United States Senate's all-time great speakers, gave me a good piece of advice. He said, never eat at any banquet or luncheon at which you are going to speak. You cannot have a full head and a full stomach at the same time. One of them must be empty. Always try and get your audience seated as close to you as possible, without spaces between them. Henry Ward Beecher was once asked, what size audience do you like best? He answered, I care not if it is 12 or 1,200, if they are seated close together, without empty spaces between them. It is difficult to get good reaction if your audience is scattered. I have said that you should at all times carry a picture in your mind of yourself successfully doing that which you hope to do. One evening, in the fall of 1919, I was in Salt Lake City. I attended a concert in the famous uh, Mormon Tabernacle, which holds some 7,000 people and is noted for its acoustics. Gallicucci, the opera star, gave a concert. As I sat in the gallery that night, I saw myself speaking from that stage to a packed house, and I carried that picture with me. Naturally, I did not tell anyone. Time passed. A few years ago, Dr. McKay, president of the Latter-day Saints, let Dr. Norman, Vincent Peale, and me put on our one-night forum, 120 minutes that can change your life in this great structure. Every seat was filled. Dr. Peale spoke first for 60 minutes. Then after a short intermission, I spoke for 60 minutes. My dream had come true. It wasn't luck, but the result of years of preparation confirming my belief that luck is but preparation meeting opportunity. We all think big thoughts, but few ever act upon them. To think is easy, to act is difficult. Unless you put your thoughts into positive action, they will forever remain unproductive of tangible results. Keep your fears to yourself, share your knowledge, enthusiasm, confidence, and courage with others. For these, you will find a ready market. Emerson said, whatever you do, you need courage. Whatever course you decide upon, there is always someone to tell you that you are wrong. There are always difficulties arising which tempt you to believe your critics are right. To map out a course of action and follow it to an end requires some of the same courage which a soldier needs. Peace has its victories, but it takes brave men to win them. Make the most of yourself, for that is all there is of you. Samuel Johnson said, Great works are performed not by strength, but by perseverance. Always bear in mind that your own resolution to succeed is more important than any other one thing. You must have a burning desire to become an able speaker. As Leonardo da Vinci stated, just as eating, contrary to the inclination, is injurious to the health, so study without desire spoils the memory, and it retains nothing that it takes in. I believe that you, my listener, have a desire to become a fluent speaker, that you like the idea. That is important. Psychologically, we now know that you can do well that which you like to do, that your abilities and your likings run parallel. Endless subjects about which you may think and plan talks await your exploration. The era of discovery and invention is not at its end. It has barely begun. You and I are living in a great age, a pioneering age that offers unlimited possibilities. Knowledge today lies before us as a great uncharted ocean from whose shore we have sailed but a few feet. We are still hugging the coast of ignorance, picking up little nuggets that lie on the beach as the great depths of ocean remain uncharted and unknown. We still have no idea as to what thinking is or what memory is, the two main factors that distinguish us from the lower animals. After years of research and study in countless laboratories, the most eminent biologists have not discovered what the most prolific thing in the earth is, life. Edison invented the electric light. 
Marconi the radio, Dumont and others the television. These and other marvels of science owe their being to electricity. What is it? We do not know. Yes, there is much to be learned and much to be talked about. By following the simple ideas here presented, you can both learn and speak. Nothing that you can do will bring recognition as quickly as the ability to speak forcefully, fluently, and convincingly. Everyone secretly longs to be able to speak well before others. The satisfaction, the thrill, and the pleasure derived from standing before an audience, accepting your ideas is beyond price. It cannot be bought in the marketplace. It must be earned, and it is well worth earning. However, beyond the satisfaction, the thrill, and the pleasure of standing and speaking before others and being favorably received, you will also have the ability to successfully influence human behavior, to sell yourself, your ideas, suggestions, products, or services, and greatly increase your income. Yes, effective speech will bring you leadership, security, respect, admiration, and friendship, and the greatest of all possessions, peace of mind, essential to a full and happy life. This is what all seek, but few attain because of lack of ability to favorably motivate others with forceful, fluent, and convincing speech. Yet, as I have shown, there is no mystery, no hidden secret to effective speech. The way is plain, the rules are simple and easy to follow. This recording shows you the way and gives you the rules. Be guided by it. And say with the poet Henley, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul.